Hello. Uh, welcome to the Voices, a library lecture series. Uh, we would like to begin with the acknowledgement that we are gathered on the sacred homelands of the Mohicanonic or Mohican people who are the stewards of this land. Today, the community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie Mohican Nation. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors, past and present. Uh, voices present uh, let's see. Voices present speakers on a timely and enduring issues each semester to broaden and enrich the scope of studies at Hudson Valley Community College. Today, Voices presents Kevin Coffey. Kevin Coffey is the Regional Chief Executive of the American Red Cross, Eastern New York region, serving 27 counties with a population of more than 3.6 million people. Mr. Coffey joined the Red Cross as the Chief Development Officer in 2016. Under his direction, he under, he grew a highly successful regional fundraising program by engaging and cultivating donors and partnerships in key stakeholders in the region. Mr. Coffey also deployed to support communities affected by large national disasters, including Hurricane Florence and Dorian. Uh, prior, prior to joining the Red Cross, Mr. Coffey has served as the Director of Business Development and Strategic Partnerships for the Patient Experience Project, or PEP. He has also served as the adjunct professor for Skidmore College, is involved in the Capital Region, Chamber, Cham Capital Region Chamber's Executive Mem Mentorship Program, and has been recognized by the Business Review and City and State Magazine as a 40 under 40 community leader. And so, for those assembled here, Mr. Kevin Coffey. Excellent, thank you, John. Uh, and thank you for having me today. Um, I know when we put out the information about this event, it was you know, talking about the Red Cross, the history of our organization is that it's still relevant today and giving you an overview of all the lines of service. So I have a slide deck that is gonna bore you to tears. Um, it is like 40 slides and it's gonna be an incredibly long presentation, but hopefully it's dynamic and you can all see how the Red Cross touches each and every one of us uh, every day in our communities. So I'm gonna start with the mission of the Red Cross because it's really important that folks understand everyone has seen the Red Cross, they see the emblem, but what is the actual mission? Like, What does this organization do? So it's simple, we work to prevent, alleviate human suffering in the face of emergencies by mobilizing the power of our volunteers and the generosity of donors. I'm gonna pull apart those two words. One, volunteers. We're a volunteer-led mission and generosity of donors. We're not a government entity, so we rely on the public to support the work that we do. And our work encompasses so many things. When you talk about prevent alleviating human suffering, that's really broad. It's a lot of different things you can work on. But it looks like disaster cycle services, our home fire campaign, biomedical services, those are the blood drives, service to armed forces, international services, and also training services. And this work can be found down the street, across the country, and around the world. And our work impacts lives each and every day. So 21,000 people rely on the American Red Cross, whether it's responding to disasters. We need to collect over 12,500 units of blood to supply 40% of the nation's blood supply. We are training people in life-saving skills, and we're also serving military members around the globe, providing emergency communications. So a little bit of a history of like the Red Cross. How did this movement, how did this humanitarian movement start? Well, it started first with Henry Dunant, who wrote a memoir after the Battle of Solferino. He saw all of these casualties during a battle. And he said, what are we doing these, you know, to take care of folks that are injured on the battlefield? And what are the rules of engagement? You know, after seeing 30,000 dead civilians in, in military, what are we doing to take care of these? So Henry Dunant started the, the movement and he wrote the first Geneva Conventions. Those are the rules of engagement. That's work that's continued with multiple Geneva Conventions, but that was really the birth, front, uh, birth point of the movement. And it started in Switzerland. And if you look at the Swiss flag, the Red Cross emblem is actually just the inverse of the Swiss flag. So that's how we got our initial kind of emblem. Then Clara Barton started the American Red Cross, seeing the work that was happening overseas. 
she became known as the angel of the battlefield. So she was on the battlefield during Civil War, making sure that we were taking care of soldiers and, and providing first aid to them. That mission has continued over 145 years later with all the work that we do here today. And the Red Cross movement is really found on these fundamental principles. And this is important stuff because the Red Cross operates, one, independently. We're not charged with you know, a government saying, you need to do this work, you need to do this. We're operating independently. Our work is volunteer-led, it's volunteer service. We're here to serve humanity and the betterment of humanity. And then we are also neutral. This is especially important during conflicts where we're not taking sides in political debates, of this side or that side, or we're not getting involved in conflict. Our job is to help everyone. Uh, we don't care about your immigration status. If you are impacted by a disaster, we're going to just take care of you. So all of this is really important to understand in the fundamental principles of the work that we do. And then if you look at the Red Cross, it's three bodies in one unified movement. So the Red Cross is a member society. So we stand here. The International Federation Red Cross is all of the Red Crosses around the world. So you have the Ukrainian Red Cross. You have the Red Cross of Canada, Aruba, Ireland, all these countries. They all have their own charters and the work that they're doing in their countries, but they all serve as member societies of the International Federation Red Cross. The International Committee of the Red Cross, that's the governing body for all of the international humanitarian law. So when there's conflicts between different countries, the International Committee of the Red Cross will be reminding everyone about those international humanitarian rules of law. And those are especially important. If you're thinking about the crises that are happening around the globe right now, it's critical that international humanitarian law and those Geneva Conventions that were first set up many, many years ago are here to net right now. Because as a humanitarian, non-combatants are not part of this conflict. So we need to preserve life, and we need to make sure that we have safe passage for folks that are non-combatants. And you can see some different emblems up here, right? So in countries where the Red Cross may be seen as more religious, we have the Red Crescent Society. We also have the Red Crystal. And these emblems will appear side by side in international work to let everyone know that they're welcome, that we're here to provide help. And we, as humanitarians serving in this capacity, are not targets. We're here just to provide help. So our congressional charter then and now. So this building right here is right across the street from the Washington Mall. Next time you're down in DC on a, a trip, make sure you stop by and, and see this. There's incredible monuments there, but the history is just incredible. We are congressionally chartered, so the government is asking us to be responsible to respond in large disasters. So that's our congressional charter. We also have a congressional charter to serve with the military, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. So a little bit about the Red Cross. It's a 501c. We have a board of governors that manages everything from, from uh, you know, DC. Uh, and then the corporate governance provides you know, some foundational about how we activate the congressional chartership and we periodically review the work. This is like the mechanics, like we're just set up as a 501c to be able to manage this work. And our mission is to prevent alleviate human suffering, make sure that we're sustainable, we're a viable organization through financial controls, making sure when people donate to the Red Cross, we are good stewards of their dollars. Make sure that we're investing in our people so we can continue this mission. We can nurture new volunteers because they're the lifeblood of the organization. And then we work on our reputation to make sure that folks, when they see the Red Cross, they trust the Red Cross. So we work on that as well. And it's an ever-evolving organization. So the work that we may have done 30, 40, 50 years ago is not the work that we're doing today because we're adapting to the times. During COVID, our organization had to change. Instead of doing in-person disaster response, we had to set up controls that we were able to do virtual financial assistance. Or we had to adapt to, if there's a border crisis, how do we support those communities? So we really just adapt to whatever the need is. And as we look at more frequent weather-related events, you'll see some of the changes that the organization's been making. But 90% of our workforce 
is volunteer. And 90 cents of every dollar that we spend is on programs and services. So this goes to the trust of the organization. And it's one of the best known profits. So it's the biggest community impact upon nonprofits. And it's the charity that most comes to mind. And Gen Z's love us the most. So folks know and trust the brand, which is important to understand. And we have a commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion. So making sure that we can serve all communities across this country. Do we have the partnerships in place? Do we have the volunteers? Do we look like the communities that we serve? So it's really important that we're investing in our people uh, and also our, our culture and community. We have a huge supplier uh, diversity initiative right now where we're working with minority and women-owned businesses to ensure that where we're spending dollars on some of our programs and services, we're making sure that we are you know, doing so with the most diverse set of suppliers. So I serve as the regional CEO of Eastern New York. So that's one small section of the country. We have 27 counties in this region. We have um, about 3.6 million people, as John shared in my introduction. And this is what service delivery looks like in this region. This work is happening each and every day. We're responding to home fires. Over the weekend, there was a home fire in Schenectady that impacted nine individuals. So like, quick homework assignment. You're going to turn on like the nightly news tonight, local news. You're going to see local sports, and you're going to see things. And then you'll hear, and then there was a home fire today. And the very last thing they'll say is, and the Red Cross was there. That happens each and every day because we have a dedicated group of volunteers that will go out and respond to that home fire. We installed over 2,500 smoke alarms um, last year in making homes safer. So just in Troy last year, we had an event called Sound the Alarm. This is where we go into communities and we install free working smoke alarms for those families. And we partnered with the YWCA, so we had a community partner, to make sure that we can reach as many homes as we can. And we just hit a huge milestone in Eastern New York last week. Since we started this program in 2016, we've installed over 30,000 alarms. So when we install those alarms, inevitably we'll get a phone call from you know, a fire department that there was a home fire. We now have over 100 lives documented saved thanks to this program. And this is something that we can, you know, if you know anyone who does need to work at Smoke Alarm, we don't really care what your landlord says. Like, if, like sometimes it's up there and the battery's not even you know, working. We provide this free of charge for people, and we also provide bed shaker alarms and strobe light alarms for hearing and visually impaired. So this is a great program that we offer in the community. And then service to armed forces and life-saving blood collection, I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to those slides. So as I said, the Red Cross is everywhere. It's happening at our area hospitals right now where a, a kid is battling cancer and he needs platelets. So your blood donation is making sure that that kid has treatment available. There's someone that's going to have a home fire tonight. Your support makes sure that we have volunteers ready to be there. So that work is happening each and every day uh, in our neighborhoods, communities, and around the world. When it matters most, the Red Cross is there. So we are the largest blood supplier in the country. We supply 40% of the nation's blood. If you think of it, you can't manufacture blood, right? Um, any of us may need blood and we might not know it. So leaving here, if someone's in an accident or someone uh, has you know, a new mother giving birth, that patient may need blood. So we need to make sure we have a constant supply. Um, and together, you know, we can work to save lives. So the need is constant. Every two seconds, someone needs blood. And the Red Cross needs to collect over 12,500 units each, um, each and every day. So 82% of those blood collections are happening at you know, community drives. So that's where people are living and work. So I know Hudson Valley Community College, you guys have a very robust blood program. How many here have donated blood before? A little bit higher, just so you can like, peer pressure your friends. OK. Um, that's critical. You know, when we have those, not only you're getting a t-shirt, you're getting you know, um, whatever incentive that we have on, but you're getting the satisfaction that you're helping someone else. And it's critical to not donate blood just once, but donate multiple times. Download the Red Cross blood app. So one, you can track where your blood donation goes. We have a really cool functionality where when you donate blood, it can actually tell you what hospital it's going to. Has anyone done that before from my blood donors? 
Do you all have the app? Okay, you have to download the app. One, it makes it super easy. Yeah, you, you can do it right now if you want. Like, I'm, I, I won't be you know, uh, upset. But when you download the app, one, you can schedule your next appointment, but you also have all your health history right there. That's also impacting the way that we're delivering our programs because we're empowering the community and patients to take control of their own health and wellness so you can schedule your own blood donation, but you get a mini health history. What's your blood pressure? What's your iron levels? In the future, we're gonna be able to check um, for diabetes, HbA1c levels, and hypertension. And we're gonna have you know, intervention points to be able to improve overall community health. That's another way that we can prevent and alleviate human suffering. So approximately 20% of donations come from young, you know, donors like college students. This is where you have accessibility, the blood drives are right on campus, but when you leave Hudson Valley Community College and you're entering you know, the real world, Make sure that you can continue that practice, but also talk to your employer about hosting the blood drive because it's critical. And we do this you know, each and every day with community partners. And it's the multiplier impact. So one donation can impact up to three lives. So if you're collecting you know, a number of units, you know, 40 to 50 donors at a drive, you have the potential to reach up to 500 lives. That's an incredible impact. And when you start hearing stories from blood donors, if you've ever been at a blood drive and you ask the blood donor ambassadors, or even if you've just talked to some friends, one person may need up to 10 units or more during a crisis situation. Some patients, because of the conditions they have, they have to go back to the hospital time and time again. And when the product is not there, they have to wait. I have a board member in Syracuse, his son is battling brain cancer. And he was going to get platelet treatment therapy, and the hospital said, sorry, you're gonna to have to come back next week. We don't have the product available for you. No parent should have to go through that with their child, and blood donations make that possible where we can provide that support for those families. So it's also important to talk, in the very beginning we were talking about our commitment, diversity, equity, inclusion. We're also working on a number of um, initiatives to diversify the blood uh, that we have uh, in our collections. And we're doing this to support a number of communities, but one is the sickle cell community. Sickle cell is one of the most common genetic diseases affecting over 100,000 individuals. And for anyone who knows anyone who has sickle cell disease, this could be an incredibly painful um, condition where because your blood cells are in that sickle shape, it's, you know, if you're in a crisis, you will need blood transfusions to help you come out of the crisis, but it's incredibly painful. So we're ensuring that, you know, we're increasing the number of, of blood donations and, you know, providing information that, you know, we have genetic testing. When you donate blood, you'll find out if you have the sickle cell trait. And then we're also promoting our sickle cell warriors initiative to make sure we have uh, more regular donations to, to support communities. And what's the overall importance of a, a, a diverse blood supply? If we have more diverse blood donors, we're able to serve the community better. Um, and there are certain blood donations that will be matched to patients who have uh, specific proteins or you know, certain blood types that will, will match for those patients. The Red Cross participates in the National Rare Blood Disease Registry. So if you have a patient with a very rare genetic blood disorder, they will be matched and kind of like Amazon, we will find the blood product and ship it across the country to help that patient in need. So it's critical that we have a diverse blood supply and that everyone donates blood so we can help all patients. And this is you know, more information on that sickle cell um, you know, disease initiative. Um, we've done a lot of great partnerships uh, with the Divine Nine, some of the uh, sororities to really raise awareness of you know, this initiative. And now blood donations are more inclusive. So I don't know if anyone saw over the summer, the FDA changed their guidance. So the Red Cross adheres to the federal government's guidelines for blood collections. And most recently they had, um, you know, over the course of a number of years, the Red Cross has been advocating for changes in the language in our blood donation deferral policy to ensure that it was inclusive and welcoming for all blood donors. So now more people are able to donate blood through the FDA's updated guidance. And what it essentially means is blood donation uh, questionnaire is not based on um, you know, your sexual orientation, it's all based on your risk behavior. So when you're having a discussion 
with the, the provider. You'll just be going through a health assessment, but that's universal for all donors, not discriminatory in any way. And the Red Cross actually did a study called the Advanced Trial to validate that you know this was a discriminatory policy and we can actually you know, encourage the FDA to lift the restriction. So seriously, don't ghost us. We have a blood crisis in this country. In August, blood collections were down 25%. What happened is we had a number of disasters. Schools are not in session, so you guys didn't have uh, the opportunity to donate. But right now it's critical when we don't have blood on the shelf for those patients, surgeries need to be canceled or a patient or a hospital have to ration blood products. So it's essential that we ensure that we have blood collections. Moving into service time forces. So this is one of my favorite uh, programs. They're all really great at the Red Cross, but this is one is near and dear to my heart. My father served in the military. Uh, he was in Vietnam and he retired after 25 years uh, uh, in the service. So the Red Cross is with service members from the time they enlist with, your, with the military branch all the way through their veteran status. So in Albany, we have the military entrance and processing center. So when you're first enlisting into the military, you'll get your information, you'll get your briefing, your family will be there, it's a ceremony. You're enlisting into service. The Red Cross is there to provide a get to know us before you need us card. So part of that congressional charter that I talked about in the very beginning is the Red Cross is gonna be serving with the military all around the globe, right? What does that actually mean? What does that look like? Well, for my family, when my father was in Vietnam, he found out about the birth of his first son through a Red Cross communication. So those communications that I talked about on the other slide, those are families you know, having new babies or a loved one has just passed away and you need to get home for those services. Those communications need to be vetted and the Red Cross needs to make sure we're handling those communications. But that's when someone is you know, first enlisting, then we're helping them cope with deployments and assist them with you know, caregiving. Up at Fort Drum, Fort Drum is in uh, Watertown, right outside of Watertown, New York. It's one of the most deployed military bases uh, in the Northeast. We offer a number of programs to help military spouses cope with deployment. And we actually have a program where we train military spouses in dental assistant hygiene programs. So they have a transferable skill if their spouse goes to another base around the country. Responded to difficult times, verifying those emergencies back home. Um, and then when folks come back, we help them kind of assimilate back into home life and we hold reconnections workshops to, to help those communities. And then we're active at the VA hospital. So right here in Albany, we have the Albany Stratton VA. We make sure that we're supporting their food pantry. So right now we're doing a food drive to make sure that their pantry is, is stocked. And we're also doing a number of programs like animal visitation to help veterans with PTSD and other issues. We also teach life-saving skills like first aid and CPR. So did everyone watch the Buffalo Bills game last year with Tamar Hamlin, right? So those first responders and that staff that was there, they were all Red Cross trained. So when moments matter, you need to know what to do. How many folks in here are CPR certified? Three, four. So if something happened, there's only four or five people in the room that raise their hand. Every, right? No, there's three people. <laughs> That's good stuff, right? You're one of the, so when moments matter, would you know what to do, right? You know, everyone, everyone could be a bystander and at least know that you need to call 911. You need to start chest compressions. But what would you do in these situations? That issue that we saw nationally in the Buffalo Bills game, that kind of ignited a whole conversation of what are we doing around youth sports? Do we have AEDs on the field? Do we you know, have the coaches be trained? Anyone though can sign up for Red Cross training and learn these life-saving skills just to know what you're, you're doing in that situation. And then when we think about globally, um, the Red Cross helps around the world. And this is some of the work that we do um, to help you know, in large scale disasters. So you'll see an event that will happen and you know, we think the earthquake in uh, Morocco or Turkey 
or a monsoon that happens or another crisis, the Red Cross, going back to the very beginning, will partner with those other federation societies and determine what help looks like. So we'll send not only financial support, but we're also providing um, you know, expertise as well. And then during large scale conflicts, folks may just become displaced. If we look at the situation with uh, Ukraine last year, where I think the, one of the figures I heard at one point was close to five to you know, seven million people had to immigrate from Ukraine. If folks had lost connection or anywhere around the globe, folks lost connection with family or you know, the immigration crisis that we're dealing with right now, using the Red Cross network and our reconnections program to make sure that we can connect back with those community members is essential. And then we also deliver life-saving measles and rubella vaccinations to children around the world and ultimately drive a 94% reduction in measles death. So we have these initiatives that we're working with federation societies to determine what the need is and then provide services to, to eradicate it. So I kind of left the biggest one for the last because I'm actually giving a presentation on this Thursday. So this is me like working out new material with you. Um, I'm having a discussion with corporate community leaders about the climate crisis. So I've talked about we respond to disasters big and small and, and you know, what does that look like? So when the Red Cross has responded to disasters, it can be you know, a single event. It's that home fire I talked about in Schenectady. My team is showing up, we're taking care of that family, putting them in temporary housing, and then working with them on the road to recovery with some financial assistance and then connecting them to other resources. But in larger scales of disasters, that could be providing basic needs like food and shelter. So a few weeks ago, actually, sorry, maybe two months ago, down in Hudson Valley, did anyone see that major flooding event that they had? So the governor was talking about, so are you from the Hudson Valley or? Okay, but it was a large event, nine inches of rain fell in 24 hours, flooding huge parts of you know, the West Point area and, and the Hudson Valley. Um, and we opened up a shelter and we brought folks in and provided basic needs and, and, and services for them. One of the stories that I heard, a volunteer came up to me at the shelter when I went to visit and she said, I know you love hearing stories from these events, so I just have to tell you something that happened. A woman had come to our shelter and, you know, she stayed the night and we set her up with some, you know, financial support and, you know, she was having some meals. She left to go back to her apartment to get whatever was salvageable. And then she also went to a thrift store to buy some new clothes because a lot of her clothes was destroyed. Her car, unfortunately, was in an area that was flooded. So it started an electrical fire in her car. So she lost her apartment, lost all her valuables. Then anything she was able to salvage was in that car. She lost everything again. She came back to that shelter and she was talking to our staff and she said, I had nowhere else to go. And I felt safe here. When folks are impacted by disaster, a shelter is not a place anyone wants to be, but sometimes it's that last hope. And those volunteers that are trained to be there to talk to them about disaster response and you know, disaster mental health are kind of critical. So providing that mental health aspect to that person that was impacted by not one disaster, but two within a very short period of time is really essential. And we meet these individuals by connecting with them and, and supporting them. But what happens is disasters are not impacting everyone the same. If you were vulnerable before, if you were facing housing security, if you were facing you know, a job where you weren't getting enough hours or you were, your housing challenges or your food insecure or you have a chronic illness, like all of these you know, add up. And we know based on data that you know, when faced with an unexpected $400 expense, you know, nearly 40% of Americans wouldn't know what they would do or, or they'd have to borrow that money somewhere. So when we're providing immediate assistance to someone who's just lost you know, everything in their apartment, that is a lifeline for helping them on the road to recovery. And in large scale disasters, what will happen is the Red Cross will open up a designation for that disaster. And that designation means that all of the funds that go into that disaster have to be spent on that community and operation. So when you say, you know, you'll be watching Sunday football and it'll be like, join the Red Cross in supporting Maui. 
all of the funds that are raised from that go to Maui to help that community recover. Um, and it's essential because you know, when we raise enough funds, we're actually able to make more investments in, in that community. Two years ago in Kentucky, there was a tornado that went through like five states. It happened right around December. Um, and you're probably like, I think I saw that in the news. If you're kind of confused about which disaster happens when, join the club, because there's a lot of them happening at the same time. But during this disaster, one of the things that you know, happened was the community you know, lost a lot of its services. And the Red Cross met with community leaders and said, you know, what do you guys need to kind of recover? Like, what is recovery going to look like for this community? And because we had raised a number of funds, we were able to build a women's um, uh, domestic abuse shelter. That's something that they had lost in that disaster. And it wasn't a traditional thing that we would normally do, but we met with that community. And that's what they said that they needed. And that was the investment that we were able to make. So the climate is changing and we're responding to more disasters. So, you know, when I joined this organization close to eight years ago, my colleagues told me like, it's kind of a quiet job. Maybe every once in a while there'll be a disaster, but you are all living through extraordinary times. Like if COVID wasn't enough, now you're looking at everything that's happening, one storm after another. In the past 10 years, more than 900 disasters have displaced more, nearly 8 million people. This is from NOAA, which is a government agency. They do all the weather alerts. So like, if you watch the Weather Channel, like Jim Cantor is probably going to these people first, right? This is billion dollar disasters, billion dollar disasters in 2023. This data was just updated through September. 24 separate billion dollar weather related events. This is having a huge impact on our country. And these disasters keep happening over and over and over again. And the challenge is the Red Cross is being asked to respond over and over and over again. So our workforce is tired, our volunteers are tired, and there's really no incentive in sight. And then if you just look from an economic standpoint, if you ever like see the news and they're talking about insurance rates in Florida, are getting out of control. Well, insurance providers are looking at and say, this is really expensive because we keep seeing more of these disasters. So in the past 10 years, the number of billion dollar disasters have increased by 70%. That's a staggering statistic. And I already shared that you know 8.5 million folks were displaced, but we're responding more than two times the disaster operations. And this last fact that in the past five years, more category four and five hurricanes have made landfall than in the previous 50 years combined. So it's more than just recycling. It's more than about just saying, I care about the planet and we should do more. We need to rethink what we do as a country to respond to these disaster related climate events. Because not only is there a disaster happen, similar to that story that I was talking about before about the woman who you know, lost everything in a disaster, the fact and the vulnerable populations, low income vulnerable populations suffer disproportionately. We as a country face staggering statistics about food insecurity with 34 million people being food insecure. And then six in 10 Americans have a chronic illness that they're managing. So all of this disaster work is happening in a country that's not healthy to begin with. Is there like another presenter after this that's gonna be like bringing you guys up and like hyping you up for some fun stuff? Because I'm bringing a lot of this like serious stuff to the table of yeah, this, is, this, is, this is the world that we're facing. Climate crisis, constant disasters, emergent needs. And the impact of this organization is demand is outpacing our capacity. Our current workforce is exhausted. Public is becoming numb to these types of events. And there's also changes in volunteerism. So when all seem lost, you kind of go back to Clara Barton. She started this organization in this country. The first chapter was in Dansville, New York, and she was a trailblazing woman. And a time when she was one of the first federal employees, female federal employees, she started a humanitarian organization that changed the world. That is showing the power of one person that can make a difference to any crisis or any challenge that we have. When bad things happen in this country, people respond. People figure out a way to make things work. 
but it's only by having the conversation that we need to address this crisis and we need to work together is something going to happen. So I'm gonna flip over to change, because uh, I'm coming up on my time. I just wanna show one quick video, because it kind of tells that whole story of what the Red Cross is doing in response to the climate crisis, and then I just wanna open up the conversation about any questions you may have. But bear with me while I get out of the slide presentation and share this video, because it is very impactful. Ending millions of lives across the country and around the globe. We are witnessing a striking number of natural disasters with greater severity than ever before. In fact, the number of billion dollar disasters in the U.S. has increased by 70% over the past decade. The number of families affected will continue to rise in both volume and suffering. However, these disasters leave their most profound mark on low-income communities, as well as those who are older or living with disabilities. The people most impacted by climate disasters are already the most vulnerable. The devastation has a compounding effect on these communities, and we need your help in the face of this humanitarian crisis. Your support is critical and will help the American Red Cross remain at the front lines to provide aid as disasters intensify. As a leading disaster responder in the U.S., we're launching nearly twice as many relief operations than we did a decade ago in response to unrelenting and overlapping disasters. And sadly, many of the same communities are ravaged repeatedly. This crisis has stretched our ability to provide life-saving meals, shelter, health and mental health services, financial aid, and more to people with no place else to go. That's why we're expanding our capacity to deliver emergency aid, enhancing our large-scale relief and recovery services, using innovation where we can, and growing partner support networks in disaster-prone communities. Internationally, we're implementing new programs to reduce climate disaster risks in some of the most vulnerable high population areas. We're also creating grassroots pre-disaster plans and engaging with youth leaders to expand their local impact. We each play a role in responding to this crisis. So at the American Red Cross, we are also doing our part to reduce our own environmental footprint through cutting emissions, waste, and water use. Even with all of these efforts combined, we need to do more. With your help, the American Red Cross will invest $1.1 billion over the next five years to meet the growing needs of this humanitarian crisis. Your commitment ensures we can continue to help those who need it most. So that last line, right, was join us. We're a volunteer-led organization. We need volunteers to serve in all different capacities to support the work that we do. But even if you don't volunteer, donate blood. Share the messaging that we have, or just become involved and become aware of the issues that are happening in this country. Um, I was so pleased when I asked the question, like, how many of you have donated blood? There's folks that already donated blood. You're like, hey, you're, you're partway there. Then I asked the question about some folks that have, you know, CPR training, and some folks raised their hand. Anyone, you know, to quote Martin Luther King, anyone can be great because anyone can serve. This is an opportunity that you can serve your country and serve your community to support one another. And thank you for the opportunity for me to come here and just share with Hudson Valley Community College the work that the American Red Cross does. I'm incredibly proud of all of the volunteers that we have in this region because they're truly the lifeblood of our organization. And I'd encourage you to join us. Thank you. <clears throat> now questions. Yes.
Um, there are like small incentives, right? You know, like every once in a while we throw a pizza party at the office. We get some t-shirts to give out to people. Um, but there's no major incentives for, for volunteers. A lot of people are doing it because it's their way of giving back. Um, but that looks different for so many different people. Like some people, like I can, I can donate, you know, my time here, or I can donate blood, or you know, some folks. I have one volunteer. It's, it goes on the spectrum. Like some volunteers, like I want to help you once a year. You're doing sound the alarm at Schenectady. I'll jump on a ladder and install a smoke alarm. And then I have another spectrum of volunteers. I have one volunteer down in Florida right now. The disaster that happened with the hurricane over the summer, we're still in operation. He's been down there for six weeks in the shelter supporting communities. Um, but he's been on multiple deployments. So it kind of really ranges, but there's no kind of incentives to, it's not like an organization where you can get you know, funds to do that. Any other questions? You scratching your head or? Okay, so close to another question. All right, yes? Part two, um, you, you briefly mentioned mental health. Was there a point in which, was it COVID a little bit before, was there a point that you think the Red Cross started putting more of an emphasis on mental health and started putting more of a focus on it, or is it all, it's, do you it's, feel like it's always been there? It's always really been there, um, and I think through COVID we saw even more of it. Um, but when these disasters happen, it's the worst moment in someone's life. Um, but also not even disasters. I didn't even touch upon this in this presentation, but mass shootings. The Red Cross is involved in responding to mass shootings. It's not something that we talk to the general public about a lot, but it's something that we do do. So um, the Sandy Hook uh, elementary shooting that happened another, a number of years ago, the Red Cross was there at the family assistance center each and every day to talk to families to find out what their unmet needs are and help them on the road to recovery. Locally, does anyone remember the Schoharie limo crash that happened? Um, the Red Cross was there to talk to those families at that family assistance center. One of the other kind of events that we saw through that, talking about mental health, is we saw during the Schoharie limo crash. If folks aren't familiar, there was um, a group that went out, they were you know, celebrating someone's uh, birthday and uh, 21 individuals lost their lives uh, when, when their limo had crashed. Um, the first responders to that event, uh, you know, they went to the restaurant, they were you know, talking with you know, the, the, the you know, you know, community members, they were talking with the, the, EM, the other EMTs. Um, our disaster mental health team w went there that day. And they were there speaking to the families all night. And they were just about to leave at 2 o'clock in the morning. And they was like, let's go back to that diner just to you know, see if there's anyone else there. And they actually met the first responders that were at that event. And they were able to just talk to them. And those first responders broke down because it was the first time they were able to decompress after that event. Disaster mental health is one of the hallmarks. And we have, if you're a health professional, we have specialty volunteers that are trained to speak to individuals about these crises. That's a great question, though. Yes? So you're saying you know, there's volunteer opportunities. So let's say someone like myself would be a first-time volunteer. Where do I go? What's the first step? Like, sure. If there's students who are interested, where do they go to start? The very, the very first step is go to redcross.org um, and you know, apply to be a volunteer. Um, right in Albany, we have our, our location. One, so I started sharing, like those very last couple of slides that I shared with you were about you know, me reaching out to corporate partners in the community to build your own team. I would love for Hudson Valley Community College to have a Red Cross club that one leader could take that charge and share information about the blood drives, share information about the food drive that we're doing for the veterans and then also help with any other service-related projects. So taking the lead and becoming a leader at this school would be critical because my team of 33 people cannot manage 3.6 million people. We need some hand raisers, and we need folks that will kind of take the, the lead at your school. So if you represent you know, a school or you represent a community, you represent an area, raising your hand and say, I want to become involved, and this is my commitment, this is what I can do, 
we'll be able to provide a ton of resources. Um, there's a National Red Cross Youth Council where you can be partnered with other schools and other academic institutions and service learning projects. And maybe you can talk to your professors about getting college credits for it. I support that. Come work alongside us. And it, I mean, it can be any track that you're on. We have a communications team. So if you're learning to go to school about marketing and communications, you can learn about that. Uh, we have an operations team, so you can learn about building management. There's so many different things you can learn. Volunteer management and HR, you're learning about all these functions with real world practical experience. Easiest step is redcross.org. Advanced calculus is probably like start a Red Cross club. I threw that challenge out there for anyone who wants it to be, step up and be the leader. Great questions. I hopefully didn't scare you with the doom and gloom of like the climate crisis, the heavy video. Um, the, the message I want to leave with you all is a message of hope, right? In the darkest times that this country's ever seen, whether it's a global pandemic or national crises or 9-11, people come together. And when they see that Red Cross emblem or the crescent or the, the star, they're, they know that help is there and communities are coming together. So thank you for donating blood. Thank you for donating your time. Uh, and thank you for your attendance today. Uh, I was really nervous that there was going to be an empty room. And I also appreciate some people took the challenge to move into the front row. So I was able to speak to some people. Thank you very much. Um, any other final questions for me? Uh, I think I did a good on time. 1.45 was when I was supposed to end. Any other questions? All right, I have my card up here. I'm also welcome if anyone wants to ask me any other questions. I want to thank you for doing an amazing job following up with me. Thank you.